got an interesting week coming up. We've got an election. Just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's in the news, some of the stuff that's happening with some political commentators and comedians online. One thing that I'm really interested in is just like the way that people's political positions shift over time, especially in the public eye. What are the kinds of things that motivate people to change their political positions? How can that be manufactured, astroturfed, etc. versus how can it be righteously and ethically influenced, ideally in positive directions? Uh, As far as who's going to win this election in November, I have no idea. Nobody seems to have any idea. I think Kamala Harris will probably win. That's purely just my opinion. Um, I thought the same thing in 2016 about Hillary Clinton, and I was wrong. I don't remember if I thought Joe Biden was going to win in 2020. Um, But I will say that I'm personally expecting less chaos this time. I'll go on the record and say it. I think that 2020 was a protracted election. And this election has the potential to be a protracted election as well, except for the fact that most of the voting is going to happen on voting day. And I think that's going to make a big difference. I think that the voting not happening on voting day in 2020 gave Donald Trump a lot of opportunity to try to figure out a way to overturn the results. So the question being, is Kamala going to win convincingly enough if she wins? Donald Trump could also win. And there's also a question there of, is Donald Trump going to win convincingly enough that there isn't legal fallout from it if he does win? Um, I suspect that no matter who wins, if it's close, there will be some legal fallout. The, um, The techniques and the tendencies of the Democrats do not tend to be focused on overturning results of an election. They've never done that. Uh, Republicans have. Republicans um, use the court, the Supreme Court, to stop the counting of votes in Florida in 2001, which, uh, after the fact, people analyzed and attributed to the reason that George Bush won, when in fact it's entirely possible, if not likely, that Al Gore would have won if those votes had been counted. Um, So even aside from 2020, Republicans have a track record of doing this. They have a track record of trying to use lawfare to stop, subvert, or overturn election results that they don't like. All of that is to say that if there are meaningful challenges to be made against a Trump victory, I think that perhaps those challenges will be made. But I also think that Democrats have done that in the past. None of it's gone anywhere because none of it amounted to um, enough to to nullify the results of an election. And that's the difference between Democrats and Republicans, is that while there may be some voter fraud here and there, 2016 was a weird election, there were, there was foreign influence, there was, you know, weird things happening that hadn't happened before, like the influence of Facebook, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but ultimately, when the evidence behind it did not amount to enough to overturn results or even throw out the results, even a portion of the results in a single state, Uh, the Democrats left it alone. And Donald Trump's presidency was unchallenged. Whereas you still, in in this great year of 2024, have Donald Trump claiming that he won in 2020, even though the case is the same, that um, while Trump and his people claim that there were discrepancies and things that Uh, were very unusual, which is likely because of the fact that it was an an election unlike any other that we've had. Um, It's pretty roundly concluded that there is no evidence at all that amounts to what you would need to even call the election results into question. And yet, despite that fact, Donald Trump um, continued to try to overturn the election. 
because he doesn't care if the evidence is there. What he cares is if he can sort of create the impression that the evidence is there so that he can continue to point to that and continue to try to radicalize people to that position um, so that he can continue making money off of them and securing various investments so that he can run for office and try to save his own skin in various ways. So, you know, I think if one or the other wins decisively, then things will probably go smooth. I think there's a very solid chance that Kamala wins decisively. You know, there's some chatter that Democrats might be underestimated in the polls a bit. There's some chatter that Trump's uh, Madison Square Garden rally featuring Tony Hinchcliffe and other unhinged speakers um, may have tipped the scales against him and that there were, you know, at, at least a fair amount of undecided voters who have become decided voters and have, you know, essentially been reminded of the racism that is uh, so palpable in Trump's administration and in the culture that he wants to create. And people reject that. And Donald Trump's only progress, I think, over the last four to eight years has been in his ability to obfuscate that truth, that the culture that, what he's, that he wants to create is a toxic, racist, mean-spirited culture. And there's a lot of people, I think, who, um, you know, became convinced through various means of propaganda, propaganda by omission, etc., that Donald Trump was not, in fact, racist or no longer racist. And I think at least some of those people were probably reminded of the fact that, that nothing has changed. And the average person, while they do understand the significance of making a joke, something that's not serious, they also understand that creating an environment where certain types of personalities and rhetoric and quote-unquote jokes can thrive is essentially the same as endorsing a certain set of ideas. And that's what Trump has based his entire political career off of. If it's not something that he will say directly himself, he wants to create create a space for people to not only say those things, but to become empowered um, and to make extremely important decisions about our government based on those beliefs that they have. Um, I think you could point to the Supreme Court. I think you could point to anybody in his administration and many media figures like Ben Shapiro and all of the people that he's brought up in his wake. All of those people benefited from speaking very favorably about Trump. Now, I'm not saying Trump directly is making some kind of decision you know, with the force of government that people like Ben Shapiro need to be favored in some way, but... Donald Trump created an environment for those people to thrive. They were willing to say what they need to, to say um, in, order to, in order to grow in that environment, and they were rewarded for that because there's an enormous amount of capital invested in creating that culture. Not from Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not in, interested in investing his capital in such projects because he doesn't care about anything really outside of, of himself, certainly not in, in the sense of... Um, investing in it he may uh he may you know make decisions on a governmental basis usually ones that benefited him personally but he is simply not the type who's going to put his money up to make some kind of change in the world he's never done that outside of of uh running for president in which case he did put his money up for that my point being that all the people uh that trump serves the people that like trump the people that benefit from trump they're the ones who invest in these media figures um, and create infrastructure for them to amplify their ideas because at the end of the day that that profits them and you see this with a figure like Tim Pool, who, in my opinion, might be kind of doing some kind of left-wing drift. Although the, uh, you know, the narrative tends to be that you have left-wing figures, political figures, public politicians, uh, um, media figures that go to the right because they are sick of the left, whatever. You have people like Anna Kasparian, Dave Rubin, and even a guy like Jimmy Dore who... You know, they start out with very firmly um, articulated left-wing positions and priorities, and then they get sort of persuaded, supposedly, by these thin, kind of ridiculous culture war arguments, uh, like whether pregnant women 
are or are not referred to as birthing persons to make the language more gender inclusive. Just just ridiculous things to be focusing on um, and allow those sort of things to be pulling them to the right. Um, there's, you know, an added factor that there are many people who are willing to invest in media figures who espouse right-wing ideas. That's, I think, an established pattern. I think it's pretty consistent. And um, I think it's pretty obvious that there's more money in being a right-wing commentator than there is being a left-wing commentator. All you have to do is just look at the disparity between those two things. And if you're including mainstream media in your analysis of that, of who's left-wing, who's right-wing, I don't think that that, uh, I'm not factoring that in. I'm talking purely about like more independent media, everything sort of from like The Blaze and The Daily Wire down, maybe The Young Turks, you know, but there's just very few alternatives to those type of media conglomerates on the left, whereas on the right, you have The Daily Wire, you know, they're putting up money to make movies and uh, movies are incredibly fucking expensive they, those are you know you, you you don't start making movies with your media company unless you are bringing in enormous amounts of money and i don't believe that that's all from revenue from the company i think that that is that also includes essentially being bankrolled by various oligarchs in america and elsewhere and that you know seems to be the case with tim pool where he you know is benefiting from this money that's coming from russia him and dave rubin and others but you know tim pool strikes this he, he likes to strike this very middle of the road type of turn type of tone where he is you know well i'm not left wing or right wing and i disagree on some things and blah 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 uh i think a youtuber named timba toast pointed out in a very long very exhaustive video of tim pool that um he does this thing where he will amplify a position that he supposedly disagrees with extremely aloud. He will talk uh, very emotionally and vibrantly about, say, the possibility of a civil war or the possibility in 2020 that Donald Trump is going to win a 50-state landslide. He will, he will loudly espouse this, uh, these ideas only to then kind of you know, quibble back and say, well, I don't think that's going to happen, but that's what some people are going to are saying. And so it creates this thing where the, the message that he amplifies is the more dangerous one, usually straight up misinformation, like in the case of Donald Trump winning a 50 state landslide, which Tim Pool repeated that claim many times, uh, quite vociferously. And uh, you know, but then by sort of backpedaling on it immediately in sort of a quiet voice, um, he is able to say, well, I've said publicly that I don't think that's going to happen. I'm just discussing the news. And it's a very kind of speaking out, literally speaking out of both sides of your mouth, almost in real time, like at the same time. It's pretty fascinating to watch him do, actually. Um, but he recently, I think as of today or yesterday, had a debate with Sam Cedar from the Majority Report, who's, who's a guy that I, that I like and respect, um, mostly agree with politically. And they had uh, about a three hour long discussion. And uh, it was interesting because I think while Tim did his sort of annoying rhetorical tricks you know, throughout. And in some cases he was very wish-washy. In some cases he, you know, claimed to essentially agree with exactly what Sam Cedar was saying. Um, you know, they, they, they seem to agree on many things, but with Tim just sort of doing more equivocating and obfuscating, but in general, they seem to agree. But, uh, it just seems that you know, Tim Pool went from saying, I'm never going to invite Sam Cedar on my program because I don't like him. I think he's horrible. I think he's a grifter. I think that he's a liar, whatever. He won't stop talking about me. He's so obsessed with me. Uh, to all of a sudden, he changed his mind and he wants to have Sam Cedar on. And I think that that may have something to do with the fact that, um, you know, he there, there is now more attention and scrutiny on some of the other sources where he might have been getting income and revenue from these shows. And so I think it's to him who, uh, you know, if nothing else, he's a smart businessman. And I think he recognizes that it might be time for him to make a shift because he's been profiting off of this right wing audience for a long time. He denies it, but he knows he does it. He knows that he caters to a right wing audience. It's impossible to look at his chat and not see that this is this, this is largely, if not completely, a right wing audience that he is bringing in. Um, 
but it's possible that he now sees that not only is this a toxic, volatile, potentially violent uh, cohort of people, but also maybe it's not that profitable for him anymore. Or maybe the means by which it is profitable are actually uh, threatening to get him into legal trouble. And so he's backpedaling on that a little bit. Um, if that's the case, it will be interesting to see because even he himself on the program made the case that you don't really see right-wing people defecting to the left in the same way, at least not as commentators, not sort of like publicly where they make this grand display of I was a right-winger, I was a Republican, but now because of Donald Trump, because of whatever abortion, I have switched sides. It's happened a few times and you have the sort of like never Trumpers who are helping Kamala and that sort of thing. But it's just not something that you see amongst uh, the people who are having the more like vibrant conversations online in the media space. You know, you don't see that momentum, that trajectory. Whereas if you have somebody who's doing moderately well on the left, like Anna Kasparian, she might be thinking to herself, well, if I just pivot on a few issues and talk about those issues a lot, I can make a lot more money at a place like The Blaze or Fox News or The Daily Wire. Um, so you don't so much see that pattern on the left if that's what in terms of going towards the left if that's what tim pool is aiming for i'm interested to see what that looks like and if it works i wouldn't mind having more commentators come to the left i guess i don't i don't really want dishonest grifter types like tim pool to start dominating the left wing space i mean they already do to an extent it's just that it pretty quickly turns into right wing politics which leaves the left wing space wide open and you only have a few people who are occupying that space and um you know we, we will see it, it just seemed to me that tim pool was striking a much more affable and really seemed to want to agree with with Sam Cedar and to present himself as somebody who agrees with all of Sam Cedar's positions. I mean, he went from saying, I want to have you on because you said I support the death penalty and that's atrocious to me. I do not support the death penalty to, you know, almost every issue that they spoke about. Tim Pool was essentially willing to concede Sam Cedar's argument and say that I agree with you. They just had sort of a strange roundabout nitpicky way of going about it. But that was essentially the conclusion of each of the, uh, of each of the talking points that they got to. So it's a curious thing. Um, you know, I still don't trust him, Tim Pool. I never will. Uh, if he feels like it's a good business move for him to tack to the left, that could indicate something interesting in the media space that I'll be curious to keep my mind on.